you so much for coming. I'm Marta Caminero Santangelo. I'm the interim director of the Hall Center for the Humanities. And it's my incredible pleasure to welcome you to the second of our annual humanities lecture series, this one featuring our own Marie Grace Brown. I have the privilege of introducing Anne Schofield, who I've known uh, pretty much since I arrived, I think, 20 years ago. Um, Anne Schofield is a professor in KU's Department of Women, Gender, and Sexuality Studies, as you probably all know. And her books, articles, and very many conference presentations have focused on the historical analysis of gender and class in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. And she's currently writing a cultural history on respectability. She's received several awards for her teaching, including the Louise Byrd Graduate Educator Award and the Kemper Award for teaching. And she's also served in many leadership roles on campus, as you may be aware, including Director of the Women's Studies Program, Graduate Director in WGSS, and American Studies, and as an Associate Dean for the Humanities. So please join me in welcoming Professor Ann Schofield. Thank you, Marta. You know, increasingly when people introduce me that they've known me since they came, I realize, my God, I've been here longer than, than anybody. So, uh, well, anyway, thank you, thanks. I am especially delighted to have the opportunity to introduce tonight's speaker, Professor Marie Brown from KU's Department of History, whose lecture is entitled, as you see, Body Movements, Positioning Sudanese Women in an Age of Empire. Marie has been a member of the KU History faculty since 2012. She holds a bachelor's degree from Bryn Mawr College and a doctorate in Middle Eastern History from the University of Pennsylvania. Marie is the author of Khartoum at Night, Fashion and Body Politics in Imperial Sudan, a book that quite simply put is a game changer. It offers a fresh and an innovative approach to the history of empire. Khartoum at Night takes us to an oft-forgotten part of the British Empire, Sudan, in the first half of the 20th century. But rather telling a story of the glories of empire or the oppression of those conquered, she, as one reviewer wrote, completely reorients the history of Sudan. Her book draws us deeply into the intimate experiences of Sudanese women through a close examination of the tobe, which you see illustrated here, um, the traditional enveloping garment worn by Sudanese women as they moved through ever-expanding spaces in the 1920s and 30s and 40s. And here they seem to be entering the hall center, don't you think, <laughs> yes? So, so it goes on, you know, it goes on. It's <laughs> And that's the first time that I ever got applause for a joke, so you, you've made my night, absolutely. Uh, given the accolades for her first book, we could hope for more about the history of Sudan for Marie. But if you know anything of Sudan, you know that it has become too dangerous, too unstable for outsiders to visit, even researchers. Now, a less tenacious scholar might shift their area of research, but not Marie Brown. Her commitment to telling the stories of intimacies in Sudan now takes her to colonial archives in Durham, England to find material for her next book in progress, Sex on the Edge, Adventures in Romance in Imperial Sudan. And I hope we'll be back here in what, two years, three years maybe? Two, okay, all right, two, 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 this. Um, Marie's research has been recognized by grants and fellowships from the Woodrow Wilson Foundation the American Association of University Women, the Social Science Research Council, as well as by competitive internal funding from KU. But you haven't come here tonight to listen to me nat around, even though you apparently like my <laughs> off the wall jokes, so you know, don't encourage me. Um, so I'll end my introduction by telling you about the epigram to Khartoum at Night. For the epigram to her book, Marie chose lines from the feminist poet Adrian Rich who wrote, I need to understand how a place on the map is also a place in history within which I am created and try to create. 
I invite you to join me in welcoming Marie Brown as tonight's humanities lecturer and as our guide on a historical journey to a place on the map. Thank you. And thank you too to the Hall Center for the invitation to be here and to the friends of the Hall Center for their support. It is both a privilege and a bit daunting to speak in front of the home crowd. <clears throat> in 1938, Ina Beasley, middle-aged and recently divorced, left her young daughter back in England and traveled to Sudan to run the fledgling government girls' education program. Just a few weeks after her arrival, Beasley went to dinner at the house of a local sheikh. After the meal, he invited her to meet his wife. Now, Beasley did not yet know Arabic, and the wife spoke no English. But Ina was curious to meet the woman just the same. Her host led Beasley to a back room, which he unlocked with a large key. Inside was a beautiful young woman, reclining on a bed and dressed in a pink silk toque. The two women did their best to communicate with small talk and gestures and a shared box of chocolates. Beasley wrote in her diary, quote, mostly I remember the pleasurable sight of her grace and beauty as she lay on her bed in her soft draperies, while I sat stiffly on a wooden chair dressed in a short cotton frock rumpled from the long, hot drive. In this scene of East meets West, the expected order of things is upended. The young woman easily reclines on a traditional Sudanese bed, while Ina sits rigidly in a wooden chair. For a few moments, grace and ease within one's own skin belong to the colonized, while Ina Beasley, the model of imperial discipline, was hot, rumpled, and uncomfortable. The surreal, upside-down quality of this encounter was confirmed in Beasley's last lines. Quote, after 15 minutes, we heard again the key in the lock, and I was led back to the outside world, end quote. An outside, right-side-up world to which Ina Beasley and her body belong. For most of my academic career, I have wrestled with two fairly simple questions. How do we understand the histories of those who have left little written evidence behind? And perhaps more importantly, how do we tell those histories in a language and with signposts and symbols that hold meaning for our subjects? And tonight, I offer my answers. Throughout the first half of the 20th century, the majority of women in northern Sudan were illiterate and adhered to a conservative harem culture in which their lives centered on the home. As a result, most historians have cast Sudanese women in the role of a Greek chorus, arguing that when it came to understanding politics and society, women did little more than echo the opinions of their husbands, fathers, and brothers. In sharp contrast, I've come to understand that when we stop looking for written texts and look instead to the body and body movements, we uncover a wealth of historical inf information told in women's own voices. But what are these movements and why are they special? I define body movements as a careful choreography of gestures, behaviors, and adornment through which Sudanese women affirmed their place in a global age of empire, or as Anne has suggested to us, drawn their place on the map. As anthropologist Jean Allman tells us, fashion is not a universal language, but deeply vernacular, by which she means that sartorial practices and symbols derive their meaning from local contexts. And we can make a similar argument about the body its movements, habits, and rituals are not universal, but intricately grounded in the nuances of time and place. Adding a further layer of complexity, the space through which Sudanese women's bodies moved was also highly charged and frequently changing. 
Tony Ballantyne and Antoinette Burton argue that empire was a self-consciously spatializing project in which colonizers attempted to unmake pre-existing maps. Ballantyne and Burton ask us to consider geographies in space not as static or neutral, but as, quote, ever moving, in which people found themselves routinely adjusting to its perpetual motion, end quote. And in this lecture tonight, I hope to bring these theories together and present the body as a powerful, sensual vehicle that made meaning of the perpetual motion of empire. I offer you three examples. The first concerns Sudanese women's local mobility. The second examines their global positioning. And I'll end with a look at the instability and legacy marked on the flesh. First, a bit of background. The idea for this project came to me while reading the memoirs of a Sudanese activist, Haga Kashif Badri, in which, at two critical points in her story, she casually mentions what she and other women are wearing. Describing the rise of girls' education in the 1940s and the common practice for girls to attend school at night, Haga Kashif wrote, quote, the girl students could move about with their tobes on after nine o'clock in the evening without fear and without anybody escorting, end quote. A decade later, as Sudan drew closer to self-governance and independence, a women's activist group organized a march of eight miles, winding from the city of Omdurman to the capital, Khartoum. Haga Kashif described the scene of hundreds of women dressed in their national tobe, shouting, long live Sudan, independence, and long live the Sudanese woman. Now, the tobe mentioned in both of Haga Kashif's stories is a rectangular length of fabric generally two meters wide and four to seven meters long, it is worn as an outer wrapper whenever Sudanese women are outside of their homes or in the company of unrelated men. It was and is an imported garment. Now, historically reserved for the wives of wealthy merchants, by the first decades of the 20th century, the taupe had become a common form of everyday dress among upper and middle class women. Now, when I began my research as a graduate student, I focused on the tobe itself, its economic value, its growing popularity, and cultural symbolism. It wasn't until much later that I realized that the bodies that Haga Kashif were describing were just as important as the clothes they were wearing. Young schoolgirls traveling unaccompanied from home to school and back again, and women marching and shouting in the streets of the capital were evidence of Sudanese bodies moving in unprecedented ways. Thus, women's imperial experience was one of movement through new, in new ways and through new spaces. Perhaps no one illustrates this expanded range of motion so well as Sitbatul Muhammad Issa, one of the most beloved graduates and staff members of the government-run midwifery training school. Opened in 1921, the Midwifery Training School, or MTS, was founded to end the practice of female genital cutting while simultaneously introducing Western biomedicine to natal and postnatal practices. Though the school got off to a very rocky start, after a few years, the methods of the new government-trained midwives had become familiar, if not totally embraced and the school seemed to offer opportunity and possibility for those willing to learn its lessons. In 1926, Sid Batul was a woman looking for a new start. Her husband had abandoned her while she was pregnant, and she and her infant son had been forced to return to her father's household. In midwifery, Sid Batul saw a path to independence and self-sufficiency. As she later described it, the school provided a, quote, protected, clean place where one learnt to be useful, end quote. Against her family's objections, Sid Batul enrolled in the midwifery training school. However, things did not get off to a promising start. Headmistress Mabel Wolfe and her sister Gertrude, known affectionately as the Wolves, found Batul dull and difficult to train. And upon completion of her midwifery certificate, 
the Wolves transferred Batul to the less demanding nursing program at the civil hospital. But Batul's determination and devotion to midwifery, and I also suspect the Wolves, didn't end. In 1930, after having proven herself at the hospital, Batul rejoined the MTS in the highly respected position of staff midwife, where she was responsible for instruction in midwifery practice and the recruitment of new students. And it is from there that Sit Batul began a noteworthy career that took her all across northern Sudan. The MTS curriculum, as Sit Batul learned and then taught it, was a praxis-based program. Students learned the basics of hygiene and obstetrics care and gained proficiency in taking temperatures, administering drugs, and suturing wounds. Um, and I'll just sort of pause on the side. And unlike many other midwifery programs, literacy was not a component of this. And so uh, midwives learned to identify drugs by tasting them or smelling them. And it's, so it was, it was all literacy not necessary. Um, so it's, it's, it's all hands on. Um, it's worth explaining that though the MTS was established to eradicate genital cladding, Mabel Wolf first introduced a more moderate and medicalized form of the procedure. Thus, MTS midwives like Sit Batul still performed circumcisions, only now under hygienic conditions and with medical instruments. Upon graduation, newly trained midwives were given a box filled with medical supplies and a uniform of a simple white toe. Yet outside the intimate moments of birth, a midwife's drugs, instruments, and biomedical knowledge were not immediately apparent. Instead, it was another highly visible sign that signaled an MTS midwife, her bright white toe, as a mark of distinction and difference. Now, historically, a midwife's unpredictable movements, often late at night and unaccompanied, made her vulnerable to censure, criticism, or even violence. And Western biomedicine and imperial rule did not alleviate these dangers. Reflecting on the difficult urban conditions, Sit Batul remembers, quote, the streets were crooked and full of old wells, some of which had caved in. There were no street lamps, and the pupils were never out, allowed out except in pairs, and they had to carry a light at night or else they were liable to be arrested. By day, we wore a distinguishing blue sash on our white toes, end quote. This blue sash was critical. It matched the blue ribbon worn by British government officials and thus identified Sit Batul and her colleagues as imperial agents whose movements should not be questioned. The potholes in the street were just as dangerous to midwives as the social censure they risked by moving about unchaperoned. A flashlight and careful steps protected them from one, while walking in pairs, dressed in distinguishing white tobes and a blue sash, guarded them from the other. But navigating pitted streets was only the beginning of expanded behaviors of mobility adopted by midwives and later other Sudanese women. In addition to performing circumcisions and attending births, midwives made frequent follow-up visits, staffed prenatal clinics, and visited area schools. Getting from one place to another required a thorough knowledge of city streets and a noted degree of physical fitness. Enduring dust and the Sahara sun and careful not to sully their crisp white uniforms, midwives pushed their bodies to a level of physical exertion that was not shared by other Sudanese women. Um, and it's only later upon reflecting, when I've looked over the um, sort of notes that the wolves have taken and sort of their register of students that they've had, um, they commented over and over again when somebody was overweight, I think suggesting that, the, that she was incapable of walking the distances necessary um, to attend the other women. More than most, Sit Batul's position at a staff, as a staff midwife meant that she was expected to travel even farther afield in order to inspect pupil midwives and recruit new students. She responded to this increase in physical demands by teaching her body to move in a new way. Sit Batul 
learn to ride a bike. Once taught, she rode everywhere, from the Amdurman market to distant patients on the outskirts of the city. And critically, Batul had to overcome more than just distance between herself and her destination. Astride her bicycle, this courageous midwife challenged conventions surrounding a woman's body and its correct movements. In contrast to her careful, measured walk through the uneven city streets, the bicycle carried Sipatul rapidly from place to place with no possibility of a chaperone. And I think the photograph here provides just a glimpse of this freedom and its possibilities. It's framed in such a way that Sipatul appears to be leaving the protection of civilization's high walls for a journey through a lonely and unmarked landscape. And I hope you can see that there is a headlamp affixed to the front of her bike as further evidence of the dangers she might face as day turned to night. Today, the Sudanese celebrate Sit Batul as an early midwife, yes, but also as the first Sudanese woman to ride a bicycle. It's a lighthearted legacy, but a meaningful one, as Sit Batul physically and figuratively crossed new ground. Multiple mobilities, both social and physical, characterized women's imperial experience. For women like Sit Batul, it was not simply the work they did, but the clothes they wore that allowed them for, to adopt new identities, behaviors, and opportunities. Educated and licensed by the government, MTS midwives held an unmistakable relationship with the imperial state. They served as cultural brokers, bringing Western biomedicine into the intimacies of the harem. And alongside these new forms of knowledge, the social authority of the government uniform provides space for midwives to move their bodies in new ways, from the mundane walk between hospitals and patients to the exhilarating speed of a bicycle ride. The imagery of crossing new ground brings me to my second example that Sudanese women's bodies were imaginative sites of global connection, a means of marking their place in a rapidly changing world. Now, to be sure, fashion and adornment brought sincere, sensual pleasure. But alongside and within these pleasures, Sudanese women demonstrated keen social and political consciousness. The tobe status as an imported garment helped to forge some of these global connections. And a reminder that the tobe is simply rectangular in, um, it's, it's just a rectangular piece of fabric, and thus in its form, one tobe is indistinguishable from the next. And though tobes today are brightly colored and patterned, in the first half of the 20th century, tobes were limited to two colors, a dark indigo or white. Thus, the differences in Tobe's styles came in the quality of the material or the pattern of the fabric, which was a white-on-white -white pattern. To distinguish one style from another, each garment carried a name. The most basic labels reference the relative weight or origin of the fabric. One of the oldest and most iconic Tobe's styles was the Bengali, a simple, everyday Tobe favored by older women and eventually civil servants, such as MTS midwives. Made of midweight, unbleached cotton with a blue stripe running along its border, the fabric was manufactured in the same factories that produced the popular lower class saris of colonial India. And so if you imagine a picture of um, Mother Teresa in your mind with a white sari with a blue edging, that is almost exactly a Bengali tobe. Other clothing items also reference the East. The traditional Surati robe worn by Sudanese bridegrooms was made of brightly striped silks from India's Surat province. And in 1950s, a popular dress style was marketed under the name Japonais. Now, there is no concrete evidence for how Sudanese women responded to labels such as Bengali or Japonais. But we should not presume that they were ignorant of or immune to the exotic locales evoked by these names. To be sure, the Bengali was a common, unremarkable tobe. And at the same time, the foreign character of the garment 
linked Sudanese women to a land of caravans and bustling seaports, along with luxurious silks and spices and sandalwood oil that were sure to have accompanied the exported fabric. Now, like all successful fashion retailers, taupe merchants were highly aware of the consumer's gaze and played upon themes of novelty and desire. It's no surprise, then, that better quality taupes carried highly evocative names, such as sugar or so soft it will make you weep. <laughs> A mid-century taupe style called yasemic, meaning it poisons you with jealousy, <laughs> was aimed directly at women who longed for a certain tobe and could not have it. This trend continued into the 1970s when economic restrictions prevented highly prized tobes manufactured by the British company Tootle, Broadhurst, and Lee from being sold inside Sudan. Women who did manage to acquire these Tootle tobes, usually from friends or family who had traveled abroad, called these much-desired pieces Message from London. The name hinted at the ultimate in exclusivity, that a woman's taupe had been specially made and sent to, from London just for her. Now, it's important to pause here and consider the function of taupe names as both a marketing tool and a form of social commentary. Direct evidence on how names were chosen was, is scarce, but they appear to be the result of informal collaborations between local merchants and Sudanese women. New taupe styles were popularized orally, spreading from peer to peer via word of mouth. More formally, specially composed love songs sung at weddings to praise the bride also advertised new taupe styles. Merchants hoped that women attending the wedding or heard a taupe described in a romantic ballad would then seek out these new styles for her own. Thus, an important collaborative process is at work. Though male merchants selected names, women's preferences determined the success of any one style. Taupe names whose designs or labels failed to resonate with women rarely became popular and are lost to history. From the 1930s to the 1950s, two critical things happened in the world of taupe fashions. First, women gained increased purchasing power and became direct consumers of taupes. No longer dependent on their husbands or fathers to purchase clothing for them, women's tastes and desires dramatically increased the rate at which new styles were introduced and then fell out of fashion. Second, these new consumers were increasingly civically minded. As girls' education improved and women entered the public sphere, a new category of Tobe names developed, which specifically referenced contemporary themes and events. To give you a few examples, in 1928, a striped Tobe named the Doctor's Ribs marked the first graduating class of Sudanese doctors from Gordon Medical School. A few years later, another striped tobe, this one named the schoolmistress's ribs, celebrated the rise of women's and girls' education. A 1955 tobe called the Agreement of the Two Sayeds marked a critical rapprochement between two political rivals. And as the nationalist movement swelled, independence, freedom, and the diplomatic corps were all popular tobes. In her observations of Sudanese women's fashion, folklorist Griselda Altaya writes, quote, topical names represent a sort of amusing and daring statement by women of their awareness of the men's world from which they were excluded, end quote. Now, Altaya is right in, to note how daring names could be. However, she understates the potential of the tobe, not just as a commentary on the world of men, but as an actual site of constructing Sudanese women's world view. It was not all politics, of course. Globally themed tobes conveyed feelings of shared progress and excitement. A late 1950s garment was named the Russian Satellite to commemorate the launch of Sputnik. And in 1965, one of the most popular tobes was the Sound of Music, 
named for the smash hit on Broadway. Now there's an understandable impulse here to try and separate the political from the personal, to argue that a tobe named independence carried more editorial weight than the sound of music. But I want to argue against that interpretation. The photograph displayed here is one of my favorites, and it illustrates how tobes and their accompanied meanings existed side by side. Sudanese women did not engage with tobes singularly or in isolation, but as a collective. The doctor's ribs, sugar, and the Russian satellite bumped and brushed up against each other. And the result was a constellation of meaning in which personal luxuries, political progress, and world technologies existed in relation to one another. Now, tobes were not the only form of adornment in which the global and the intimate came together. In Leila Abu Leila's novel, The Translator, a story about multiple loves and belonging, the protagonist Samar carries visceral memories of her childhood in Sudan. Samar explains, quote, we have a winter in Sudan, a cold that does not punch inside the bones, is content to crack people's skin, turn it into the color of ash. She remembered tasteless Vaseline in plastic tubs with grains of sand brown and coarse in the thick silver mess, or Nivea cream, the blue tin of luxury that came with a German ad on television. He asked her, which is bluer, the Nile or Nivea tins? Now in the novel, the question goes unanswered, but it is not foolish. The German blue tins of luxury were as central to Semar's childhood as the waters of the Nile that flowed around her city. And I want to be clear here that I'm not just making a point about global consumption, but about global place in which the blue of the Nile and the blue of Nivea tins were equal parts of women's lives. Adornment took Sudanese women on imagined journeys from India to London to Broadway, voyages that they were, in fact, unlikely to take themselves. And yet the pleasurable acts of fashion and bodily care yield a narrative of women's experience that is almost, almost entirely absent from existing histories. Women were not uninformed or isolated in their homes. Instead, they wrapped dynamic global imaginings around their body in order to construct a position for themselves in the midst of revolutionary mov movements, spice caravans, and satellites. Now, it would be easy to end my talk here, with Sudan on the brink of independence and Sudanese women as fashionable, engaged citizens of the world. But I want to raise a point that extends beyond the scope of my book and one that I'm still in the process of understanding. So far, my argument has been that Sudanese women responded and adapted to the changes brought by imperial rule by constructing a new repertoire of fashion and body movements. And I contend that women were largely successful in using their bodies to mark and establish a sense of place. But if we look closely, especially into the first decade of independence, we see signs of bodies that are uncertain, stubborn, or turned upside down. Thus, even as the Sudanese body politic adopted a rhetoric of modernity and progress, bodies themselves could feel out of step. The final legacy of the MTS serves to illustrate this point. As part of the larger curriculum on healthy natal practices, Mabel Wolf introduced the supine birth position to northern Sudan. Now, traditionally, Sudanese women had given birth standing up, braced on a rope hanging from the ceiling and supported by friends and relatives on either side. Convinced that this upright stance placed too much strain on the mother and the baby, Mabel had her patients lie on their backs on a piece of rubber sheeting, thus earning the position the name the Macintosh birth. Practice of the supine birth position spread quickly, so much so that one could reasonably estimate a child's age based on whether she had been birthed on the rope or on the Macintosh. 
But the rapid adoption of, this, of the Macintosh did not necessarily indicate that this position was preferred or welcomed. One woman who had birthed children in both positions reported that laboring on the rope was easier, but that MTS midwives would only administer medicine if one lay down. <laughs> Thus, the cultural violence that accompanied laboring women on their backs may not be immediately apparent. Yet the Macintosh birth quite literally upended the primary function of motherhood and how it was carried out. The line between choice and coercion blurred. But one thing is clear. As women moved from the rope to the Macintosh, they increasingly aligned their bodies to foreign imperial standards of discipline and authority. The sensation of bodies turned upside down was repeated in the years after independence. This time, it was Sudanese women who drew attention to the ways in which their lives were off balance. In the late 1950s and early 1960s, illustrations and political cartoons in Sudan's most popular women's magazine, The Woman's Voice, repeatedly show women who were upset, disjointed, or falling down. In April 1961, as part of the Pictures of Our Lives column, the magazine ran a series of cartoons condemning the practice of Beit al Ta'a, or, um, the House of Obedience, a legal statute which permitted a husband to pursue his wife and force her to return to his household. One image captioned, The Road to the House of Obedience, shows a husband dragging his crying wife by the hair. The artistic simplicity of the image presents a striking contrast to the gravity of Sudanese women's legal and social subjugation. The woman is helpless, on her back, vulnerable to her husband's violence and the state's tacit acceptance of the abuse. It falls to the youngest child to try and set his mother upright. This same magazine issue also told of an entirely different threat to women's bodies. Published in the style and beauty section, the comic strip um, narrates the story of a woman who falls victim to the influence of Western fashion. Reading right to left, the first panel shows a woman dressed modestly in her tobe, observing another woman, Dee Dee, who was walking down the street in a tight dress and high heels. Envious of Dee Dee's shoes, the protagonist sets out for a European shoe store. After making her purchase, she puts on her new high heels and takes a few tentative steps. Um, the folds of her tobe get in the way, and she yells, my veil, as she falls to her knees. In the final frame, the woman stands barefoot, clutching her old sandals, head hanging down in shame. She has made a costly mistake. The high heels had not enhanced her beauty, but threatened her modesty and brought her to her knees. Anxieties about rapid social and cultural change were frequently personified in bodies that were in disarray. In 1963, in the midst of heightened political tensions, the woman's voice ran another cartoon of a woman's body contorted in a strange position. Her torso leaned to the right while her hips jutted to the left, her feet stomping in the middle. She calls her friends to join her in dancing the twist. The impropriety of her actions is confirmed by her disheveled hair, the cigarette in her hand, and the whiskey bottles at her feet. Unlike Dee Dee, the dancing woman is drawn in such a way that she cannot be mistaken as attractive or a woman to emulate. Her body is unnatural and her actions undesirable. The literal and figurative upending of women's bodies are illustrative of the continued challenges posed to Sudanese womanhood in the mid 20th century. The campaign against genital cutting, Macintosh births, an expanding worldview, and imported fashions all created a terrain on which women were no longer sure of their footing. It makes sense, then, for bodies to be in disarray. What I am most interested in is this question of imperial legacy, an ideological inheritance, which is also a bodily inheritance, 
which continues to shape how Sudanese women understood their bodies and the world through which they moved. Here it's helpful, I believe, to return to Ina Beasley and her discomfort in meeting the young wife of the Sheikh. For Beasley, a civilized body was a comfortable body, one that was at rest within itself. And yet within that locked harem room, order, comfort, restfulness, and elegance had reversed themselves and been turned upside down. By the 1960s, the editors of The Woman's Voice and the majority of its readership were born into a world shaped by Ina's imperial standards of the body. Belonging to upper middle class urban families, these young women were very likely birthed on the Macintosh and had graduated from government schools still guided by Ina Beasley's curricula. Thus, Sudanese women's illustrations of nervousness and imbalance as manifested in the body are not haphazard or accidental. For these women had been schooled in a critical imperial lesson that disciplined bodies were outward signs of inner civility. Thus, what is most striking to me about this collection of images is what is not depicted. In the first years of independence, Sudanese women seem unwilling or unable to imagine their bodies as stable, assured, and at rest. I want to end with a call for a recognition of the body as a historical text. Attaching historical value to physical sensibilities allows us to address questions about agency, power, and change in new ways. And still, we must be careful not to reduce our actors to no more than their discrete parts. My argument is not simply that an analysis of the body should serve as a complement to traditional written archives. Rather, I want to draw our attention to the ways in which men and women recognized in their own bodies a dynamic accounting of individual and group experience. This accounting was complex and contradictory, carrying messages of movement and global progress, but also uncertainty and instability. Critically, while fashions and political rhetoric might be quick to change, bodies move at a much slower pace. Historian Dorothy Coe cautions that when we tell familiar histories, we quote, seldom take stock of the detritus littering the path, the stubborn body, end quote. For this next generation of historians, it is precisely this stubborn, marked, moving body that animates new actors and gives rise to new stories. Thank you. So I'm happy to entertain questions, or perhaps I've answered all possible questions. Um, so indigo tobes are completely lower class, but I have anticipated somebody's question. There we go. <laughs> um, so these are, these are lower status tobes that would have been defined simply by the weight of their fabric, and so they are um, not subject to sort of the changing winds of fashion as the, the white ones. But, um, yes, so, so there are class distinctions that we made making um, at the time, and these would be the, the indigo versions. And I hope you can see even in these photos sort of the difference in the quality of fabric between these um, and these nice patterned ones and then this um, very rough spun indigo cloth. I was wondering, it looks like there would be multiple ways of wearing the tobe, mm. and uh, did it mean something how they chose to wear it? That's a great question. Um, so there is actually only one way to wear it, and I've, I didn't bring one, but um, you, so, so one of the, there are no fastenings, and so you sort of start with it behind you, you tuck part of it sort of under your elbow this way, wrap it up around, and then swing it over your shoulder. Um, and it's, so it's in, incredibly cumbersome, in fact, um, in that it's, you can't really do anything while you're wearing it because moving both arms at once 
can, can sort of cause the tobe to fall down. So um, in fact, um, Ina, who's a, a woman that I just sort of love the more that I get to know her, um, so she's very much concerned with discipline and decorum and proper behavior. And so when she first arrives in Sudan, she's outraged um, that girls are um, dressed like this girl without any tops. And so she says, to, to come to school, you must be covered top and bottom. Um, and the only option is for young girls to adopt um, their mother's tobes, which are huge and um, completely unwieldy. And so these girls um, come to school, and they've got yards of fabric that they're dealing with. And so <laughs> Ina finally realizes that you can't actually teach while wearing a tobe. And so you wear the tobe to get to school, and then both teachers and students neatly fold their tobes <laughs> and put them away um, so that you can concentrate and pay attention, um, which I think also speaks to, to sort of the class and the luxury quality of that. that this is something that is, um, it is a garment for women who aren't out and about, who aren't active. So they're not folding it. They're not sort of discarding it, right? The, the folding and discarding is only made possible because you're in this enclosed, safe classroom. Um, lower class women, um, there's a number of, I'm trying to decide which direction to go in. There, there are no good answers, right, for these lower class women, right? And so um, women who are sort of out in public, so slave women, women who would perhaps be serving tea on the street, servant women, um, yes, their bodies would have been exposed, which speaks again to their vulnerability as belonging to a lower class of slave status or former slave status, um, the suggestion that they might be um, prostitutes or something like that, right? So in fact, their bodies are made incredibly vulnerable by the act of um, working. And I, and I think that, so one of the things that um, gets sort of my larger theory, right, is that so I find it incredibly difficult to wear a toe because I have not been schooled in how one wears it. Um, but the Sudanese women who I encounter, right, have figured out how to move, right, with, with this garment on. They continue to wear it. Um, in the same way that I have figured out how to walk in these high heels, right? Um, so, so this is my cultural body movements. These are my techniques um, that are it's sort of ingrained in this culture. Um, and so there is, um, there is exposure that's going on on the part of lower class women, and then there's also just training and learning, right? That, that, that um, we, our, our bodies learn how to move within the constraints of what we're wearing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That was a really uh, interesting talk. And um, uh, I have a question. Maybe it won't directly, I guess, address uh, the main point of your argument, but something I wanted to clarify for me, um, I thought that it was this underlying concept, if I can put it simply, uh, where you were saying in a way, well, what I thought maybe, and you could correct me if I'm mm -hmm. wrong, that you know, tradition and culture um, somehow equals lack of freedom or mm. um, being held back, whereas like westernization and, you know, but you, you mentioned biomedicine and midwifery, how, you know, how that brought about some kind of uh, agency in mm -hmm. women. So am I getting this right? Is that like tradition and culture equals, in your opinion, lack of freedom in women, whereas Western ideas and concept equal emancipation and women's freedom? And I just clear, I mean, if you can clear. Sure, absolutely. Um, and I have to walk sort of a very fine line. Um, so I... Um, certainly do not equate tradition and culture with confinement and um, westernization with freedom. However, right, what we do see is that the um, culture that Sudanese women lived in at, um, at, at the time was one of, um, the, the word that I use in my book is enclosure, right, and that, that they live lives that are very much um, inwardly looking and inwardly focused. So, but, but what, what imperialism does do is, is it brings violence, it brings oppression, it brings subjugation, um, a lack of sort of political agency, certainly, but it also does provide opportunities for women um, to, to move in new ways, to move in new spaces. So formal, formal education um, for Sudanese girls does not exist on any significant scale until imperialism comes, right? And so it's, 
um, I, I, so there's sort of this sort of razor thin line, I think, to walk between acknowledging cultural constraints that um, women once lived under, and then what I would say is that the um, opportunities that they seize and grasp upon um, it's sort of on their own volition, right? So this is where I think sit tool on a bicycle is, is something, that, a, a choice that she's made on her own, right? Um, and and sit tool sees midwifery as a way of living a life different than what would have been laid out with her before. But, but thank you for that correction. Um, I, I have a question, I guess, also about the arc of your story. And, sure. Um, I was struck really by, um, how in many ways forms or of, of coercion and disciplining of the body that we might describe as imperial um, seem, seem to grow more coercive actually after empire mm. and, and, and indep in independence. And you know, in perhaps it was just the story of Sid Batul, which was so, uh, so much about empowerment and mobility. Mm -hmm. uh, but this, you know, I was, this, uh, I was sort of found this, these independence uh, images kind of haunting uh, and, and, and your discussion of, of this more violent forms, essentially, of, of childbirth. And so I'm wondering if you see broader implications for understanding the post-imperial, the post-colonial in, in Sudan or in Africa more generally. So the story of independence not bringing everything that one hoped for has been done, right? But I think the, the ways in which it's articulated as um, instability of the body is, is something that, that, that strikes me as something that needs to be unpacked further. Um, and, and, and because, and so this would perhaps require um, looking both forward and backwards, right? So how was political and social instability um, envisioned, imagined sort of before the imperial period, right? Was it located on the body or not? And then um, afterwards, we certainly see that women seem to sort of be localizing it there. Um, see, I, I think that it has sort of a great deal of implications for um, not just sort of the, the dream deferred of, of post-colonial movements, um, but of the, of the ways in which uh, imperial lessons become imprinted on, on bodies, right, and marked on bodies. So one of the things, can you see that the cheeks are scarred on these girls? Um, so that was a traditional form of beauty. Those are beauty marks that have been put onto um, girls' cheeks. Um, but as urbanization happens, and they're, they're tribal, um, as urbanization happens and people live less in tribes, cheek scarification is no longer a sign of beauty. Um, and, and style and beauty columns say, don't scar your cheeks. Well, for women whose cheeks are already scarred, right, there's, there's not much you can do about it, right? And so um, I think what I'm interested in is this sort of lag time also between how ideas change, but bodies can't always change at the same time. This is a great talk, and I have a very on-brand question um, about the role of mobility in all of this. Um, so you're, you're speaking about movements, and I'm, I'm curious if you could talk about, we have Sudanese women moving between sort of a patriarchal system and the imperial system, both systems place them in very specific positions, and I'm curious if you can talk about how mobility plays a role here, if, if it's um, sort of secondary to the question of women being liberated or not, or is it actually constitutive, the way that they move, the rhythms in which they move, the destinations they're going to, um, are these actually sort of front and center, and are they separate and sort of binary systems of mobility, or are they actually overlaps between the expectations in a patriarchal system and the imperial one? And, and you're talking about actual moving from one place to another, when you use the word mobility, right? Is that what you're talking, yes. Um, so I think that they are, um, I think, so patriarchal continues throughout, right? And so, um, so there's, there's a, a Sudanese saying, um, a, um, a good Sudanese woman leaves her house twice in her life, wants to be married, wants to be buried. Um, and so we are, um, so, so this is the old sort of patriarchal system, right, in which lives are very much circumscribed around the home, right, in which you are in the presence of um, uh, fathers and then husbands. 
And what I think that, but yes, so I think that there is that the move to um, sort of imperial structures uh, allows for things like bicycles. It allows for the walk from home to school. Um, women, uh, civil, women who become nurses and teachers, midwives are also traveling on trains. And so there's a lot of back and forth. It's sort of what class train ticket uh, they qualify for. Um, but there's, there's also still this um, very clear sense of, of, of protection that has to happen. And so we see this kind of hybrid quality. So I mentioned that girls attend school at night. Um, part of that was uh, shared resources so that boys were in the schools during the days and so girls could use the empty schoolhouses at night. Um, but the other thought was that um, less people would be out and about, their bodies wouldn't be exposed in particular ways. Um, the image of the women entering the hall center. Um, so they are, um, in fact, these women are going to a um, housewife association meeting, and I believe it's at this meeting, for the first couple meetings, um, they intentionally held it in a building with high walls um, and asked policemen to come and stand guard to make sure that no one else would watch these women come in. So there's this, um, so there are all these different rules governing this movement, right, that, that feels in s both, I think, sort of liberating, but also sort of very confining, right? And so that they are trying to sort of chart a path between entering new spaces while respecting these sorts of larger notions about being enclosed. I don't know of any overlaps between bodies, fashion, and architecture, um, but that, that would be a fascinating question, right? So how do, so thinking about sort of walled buildings, right? So how do, um, how do you then build spaces for women to enter, right? Um, the, the question about desire is one that I have long struggled, if not to answer, then to footnote correctly. Um, because I know what it feels like to put on a silk blouse or a cashmere sweater, um, but I don't know how to translate that into something intellectual, right? I don't know how to, other than sort of footnoting, like every human experience ever, cashmere feels great. I, I don't know how you, <laughs> I don't know how you, I, I, I don't know how to say, um, or, or to talk about um, what it would feel like to, to, to buy a new beautiful tobe and, and wrap yourself in it and to be navigating both heat and sandstorms but also, you know, cool lemonade, right? And so, um, and this, so this is something that I sort of just struggle with as part of the larger project is um, I just keep using the word sensual, 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 tactile, 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 visceral, visceral, visceral. And those are kind of okay words, but I don't think they get to, um, they don't get for the to, the, to the idea of so soft it will make you weep, right? Or um, poisons you with jealousy. It, it doesn't, we don't have the intellectual words to talk about um, desire in that way. Um, and I regret it. I feel a little awkward asking this question after a series of sophisticated questions and, and still more sophisticated answers. Um, but you're talking about Sudanese women, and I'm wondering, is this, Sudanese, is this really about Sudanese women in general, or is it yeah. really Sudanese women in Khartoum? That's a great question. Thank you, Jeff. Um, so the project is um, largely focused on northern Sudan as opposed to southern Sudan. Um, but you're right that this is um, very much an urban story. Um, so that the written records that we do have of women are they are, are they were they were from women who lived in Khartoum or Omdurman, right? So this is an urban story. This is a Muslim story. It's an Arab story. It's an upper middle class story, um, with one caveat, and that is the records that I've obtained of Tobe names, um, and that's all I have. Um, I don't have Tobes themselves. I just have lists of names, and so I've gathered those from a number of different sources. Some of which have been 
um, located in Khartoum and Omdurman, some of which came from studies in um, Darfur, and some came from other sort of outlying um, rural areas or sort of non-central capital region areas. Um, and believe it or not, they all mention more or less the same toad names, right? Which, which suggests to me, right, that the, a, a resonance and a currency, at least of those names that survive, right? Um, and so this is um, it, an, an urban story that I hope is slightly outward looking. Um, and, and I think that this, again, sort of goes to underscore the, the value of the names of the Tobes and the ways that they did resonate is that um, we get overlaps pulled throughout Sudan. I enjoyed it a lot. And there's a lot of similarities between what you're saying and what happened in Kenya. Now, where <coughs> are these women moving? Is there any way they influence the colonial state? Mm. I, I didn't hear much of that. Can you tell me a little bit? Of course, they are here in education. They are in everything else. But what is their influence? Um, so, what is their influence on the colonial state? So, it is, it is admittedly not large. Um, certainly, we see a larger uh, sort of political push and political agency on the part of Sudanese men um, who become part of the, the government, um, sort of progressively part of the government as independence nears. Um, but, but Sudanese women, and, and I should say, I am using the term women because they would have um, considered themselves women, but by our counts, they would have been girls. So um, some of the earliest, the um, activists who um, begin the earliest uh, women's feminist groups uh, were all under the age of 25 when they began. And um, they had in fact gotten sort of a very early start in that they um, led a number of walkouts and strikes um, at their high school, um, which certainly um, influenced or at least impacted the, the um, British women and imperial agents working in those schools as they're sort of dealing with um, girls who aren't attending school any longer. And, and, and these girls wrote letters to the newspaper and there was sort of a big sort of kerfuffle about it. Um, but but I, I don't think we see huge sort of movement in the other direction. Um, and, and, and I think this is again sort of a class story in that many of these girls, while upset with the, um, or against the notion of imperialism, recognize the value of the education that they were gaining. Um, they go on, I think in, um, many of them go on to f join larger sort of third world um, alliances and corporations, so um, organizations of African women or organizations of Arab women or Asian women. And so they certainly um, become part of a larger, I would say, um, leftist anti-colonial movement, um, but sort of direct affecting on the colonial state um, is, not, um, is not as obvious as it would have been. Okay, so I'm gonna show this picture because I brought it. Um, these are the wolves, Mabel and Gertrude. <laughs> um, and um, though I can't, I don't know for sure, but I think um, the woman in the front left is in fact Batul. That smile looks um, very similar. But I, and I like this because you can sort of see the cursed distinctness of the uniforms of the midwives, right? And then the two sort of servant uh, women um, who would also have been working at the school but would not have been midwives. So these are some of the, the visual distinctions that people might have seen sort of walking down the street, right? Being able to identify um, a woman like Sid Batul versus um, one of the others. Um, oh, and one final postscript. Speaking of Sid Batul, um, since I got time, um, I, about a few months ago, I received an email address, somebody I didn't know, subject line, Sit Batool. And it was a man, a British man, who had spent his boyhood in Sudan in the late 1950s, early 1960s, um, who had known Sit Batool and um, was in the midst of sort of writing his memoirs and just sort of Googled her to see I don't know what he expected, um, but uh, my book, 
and this picture came up. And he wrote to me, he said, this is incredible. Like, this is the woman that I know, that I remember. Um, I spent time with her. She was always in that white tobe. Um, so it was this sort of just sort of this lovely, wonderful moment of um, recognition of this woman, right, c continuing um, on down the lines and, and the ways in which she was um, just, just a presence, I think, in so many people's lives.